Okay, so this is basically everything I took with me on the West Highland Way trip. And this is pretty much what I would carry with me for probably 95% of any kind of hiking trip that I would go on where I was trying to keep the weight down as much as possible. Um, everything here, bar just a couple of items, is what I had in my pack. Uh, so not including like the clothing that I was wearing at the time. The only thing that's missing from this is one, uh, one litre water bottle and an extra gas stove that I took with me and some Compede uh, foot plasters because I used them all on the trip and I'm making this video after I've done the trip. So basically all I'm going to do is run through um, everything that I had in my pack um, and maybe discuss a little bit about how I would change it depending on the kind of trip I was on. Um, how I found it on this trip and what I would and wouldn't take with me but I can say just now pretty much everything you see here I would probably take again also not included in this layout is the food that I took with me uh, we went for five days um, and I took all of the food for the five day trip with me I haven't included it here because one because I've used it and two because I think the food in itself is a, a video in itself but um, when it comes to food Really, what you're uh, looking at doing is calculating exactly what kind of trip it is you're doing, um, how much calories you're likely to be using, and you're going to try and keep the weight down and the bulk down as much as possible. I took um, dehydrated food with me, as well as a few other additional things to sort of fortify the food, like olive oil and uh, nuts and things like that. But Basically what you're looking at when it comes to food for your an average um, sort of meal is probably somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 calories a day um, for a, a fairly steady sort of continuous hike. Um, if you're conservative about how you pack by removing sort of unnecessary packaging and stuff and you divide your food up for the each day that you're going to be using it so you can keep track of what you're consuming and what you're not consuming um, you can generally get the weight down to just under two pounds of weight per day for the food. Um, you can get it down quite a bit more than that if you're really clever about it, but basically what you're looking at is about two pounds a day. So for a five day trip, you'd be thinking, okay, well, that's sort of like ten pounds of food right there on the, in addition to any weight that you're carrying on your pack. That being said, however, if you're doing a five day trip like I, I was, I, I didn't take a breakfast with me for the first day and I didn't take an evening meal with me for the last day because I was starting at a time where I could have breakfast before I start and I knew I'd be finishing just before the evening meal or thereabouts the evening meal. So you can cut a little bit of weight there as well. Water, again, is also dependent on your location and how much you take with you. Um, for a trip like the West Highland Way, where water is plentiful, you don't have to carry sort of lots of water with you, you don't have to carry um, platypuses or any of these kind of things, there's, there's streams everywhere. Um, I took two one litre bottles of water with me generally uh, and I tried to keep it so that one of them was always empty and one of them was always full because I would rotate between the two to do with the purification tablets. Um, I would consume one bottle of water and then once it got to nearly being empty, I would fill another bottle of water up out of a stream, add a purification tablet, and then leave it. It would generally take more than 30 minutes for me to finish the first bottle, um, and by that time the other bottle was purified. Also, when I came to camping near night time, I know that I would need at least a litre of water in the morning for my food, for breakfast, and for a, a, a drink, and things like that. So I would have a little bit of water left in one bottle, I'd have a fresh one litre bottle ready for the morning time. And that's how I, I worked the, the water. For a five day trip, you don't need a pack any bigger than the Osprey Exos 48 pack. You could actually, at an absolute stretch, use this for a 10 day trip. I've managed to get all of this gear, plus almost 10 days worth of food, into a pack just like this. It wasn't particularly easy, and to be honest, it's really pushing the limits of the weight capacity of a pack like this, just on food weight alone. The rest of this stuff is actually fairly light. But I would say for anything up to about six or seven days, definitely a five days, 
you do not need a pack bigger than that. You see a lot of people taking 65 litre packs. If you buy a 65 litre pack, you'll just fill a 65 litre pack up and it's completely unnecessary. It was a fairly comfortable pack, it's lightweight, it's got a, a really comfortable sitting position. I did have a little bit of trouble with one of the straps uh, rubbing on my shoulder to begin with, but eventually as you walk the pack sort of breaks its way in and uh, you get used to it after a while. I didn't take a waterproof cover with me um, because I was using uh, a poncho, which is what all the kit here is laid on, uh, when it was raining which was pretty much every day on this trip, I'd put the poncho over the top of me and the pack. Now, if money's no object and you want to cut the pack weight down even more, you can get something like the Arc Blast from Z-Packs, I think. Um, it's like a Cuban fibre type backpack. Gareth, who was on the trip with me on the first uh, couple of days, he had that pack. It's a very good pack. Um, it doesn't hold any water whatsoever, It's because Cuban fibre is a type of plasticated type material um, it doesn't retain any water whatsoever which is a massive benefit when it comes to packs because it rains so much on this trip I did actually notice that eventually this pack did retain a little bit of water and it did actually bring the weight of it up a little bit as did my basho or poncho um, that I was using as a shelter um, the only time I wouldn't use a pack like this I think because it's one drawback is these lightweight hiking packs are slightly fragile in comparison to your sort of um, bushcraft type militarised packs. Um, a favourite pack of mine is the Rush uh, 511 uh, backpack which I use on pretty much all of my bushcraft trips. I would use a pack like that if I was going to a place where I thought the terrain was so hostile that my pack would take a bit of a kick in. Um, maybe some sort of like rocky mountainous uh, areas, uh, high desert uh, areas that I knew I was going to be doing a lot of bushwhacking. It wouldn't really take much to damage a pack like this. In fact, in just a little five days, a couple of little holes did appear in netting this. And we pretty much uh, were on a trail the whole time for five days. But other than that, that's pretty much the pack I would take on the vast majority of just basic hiking trail type uh, outings. Okay, when it comes to spare clothing, basically what I do is I tend to run a sort of wet and dry system. Whereas, if I accept that my, my clothes are going to get wet, I just accept that and I make sure I've got one complete set of dry clothing. At night time or when I'm in camp, I'll get out of my wet clothes, clean myself off and then I'll get into these dry clothes. And then in the morning when I wake up, um, I won't get any dry clothes again. If it's still raining, uh, what I'll do is I'll put my wet clothes back on um, if the environment allows it to happen, which in this case it did. So I took one additional pair of these lightweight hiking trousers, this is the uh, Bear Grylls Survivor type trousers. They're pretty good value for money if you get them like on a sale. They're comfortable, they're lightweight, they dry really quickly, So and they've got like stretch panelling. Um, so th they're a pretty good option. Um, I took with me two Merino wool uh, walking socks. You want to take yourself at least two pairs, there's only one pair here, but two additional pairs of underwear. And a lot of people don't seem to realise the importance of good fitting, decent underwear. Don't cheap out on the underwear because, you know, if you're walking for 20 miles a day plus and you've got, you know, a thong riding up your ass or whatever, that's just going to cause you more problems in the long run. So make sure you've got really good stretchy type, um, breathable um, underwear that you can, uh, that you know fits you properly and isn't going to give you any sort of rubbing issues and problems like that. That being said, I didn't cheap out on it and I did have a little bit of rubbing issues but I mean that's just part and parcel of what happens. Take with you an additional um, hiking t-shirt. I took a lot of stick for this one because uh, it, it, it looks so ridiculous. What this is, is a uh, merino wool. a merino wool net type shirt. It's incredibly warm if you wear a fleece over the top of this because it has a type of honeycomb type effect to it. Um, it, it and it's unbelievably breathable obviously because it's kind of net looking. Um, 
it was incredibly comfortable and even in light rain I was wearing this and I was walking and I felt completely fresh and aired out and there was no sweating issues or anything like that because it's so aired out. A lot of mountaineers use these kind of tops um, as their base layer. It's, that, that's basically what this is, is a, it's a merino base layer top. Um, a couple of drawbacks to it is that it doesn't really offer much in the way of sun protection obviously because uh, you know the sun can penetrate it pretty easily so if it's a really sunny day you might want something that can uh, give, provide arm coverage and more body coverage. I always take a normal sort of sports um, um, breathable t-shirt with me anyway and the only other disadvantage is that it looks bloody ridiculous um, I was walking around with this like nipples were sticking out and stuff but hey who cares you know it's not a fashion show a warm jacket of some sort for when you're in camp um, or just standing around doing nothing I took my uh, buffalo um, jacket with me I never used this once uh, there just wasn't time to do it um, you could take a uh, a down jacket with you or something to sort of cut the weight, I don't have a down jacket so I took this with me. It is a bit weighty but I would take it again because I know that if I was in camp for long enough I would really appreciate having something like this. It was just unfortunate on that trip because of time constraints I ended up never using this at all. All of that clothing was put into a lightweight 12 litre dry bag and that was uh, pretty much stored at the bottom of my pack. In addition to clothing, I also had a micro fleece. I put this micro fleece into its own 5 litre dry bag and what I do with that is I keep that on the outside of my backpack in the net so that if I'm standing around or I'm feeling particularly chilly I've got easy access to this fleece that I can just put on um, rather than have to sort of dig down to the bottom of my bag looking for a fleece to put on it's just right there on my backpack and I would frequently take that on and off putting it into its own dry bag as I go uh, and whenever I needed it so my sleeping system consisted of a Firmarest self inflating mat this is the regular size I did want a small size, I don't think it's necessary to have the regular size but it just so happens that at the time I bought this they didn't have any and I needed one so I bought it. An ultralight um, bivy sack, it's waterproof, breathable and incredibly light, much lighter than the sort of military uh, grade type ones that you get that are made of a type of Gore-Tex material. This is just a sort of uh, thin nylon type material. Pretty good. It's probably not as breathable as they make out, but it's necessary if you're not sleeping in a confined sort of uh, space like a tent or a hammock. Um, I use a, a lightweight synthetic sleeping bag. Um, I took a sleeping bag that was rated to on or just slightly above whatever the average minimum temperature at night time is. Uh, at the time of year I was going, it is possible to get down to sort of zero degrees Celsius. Um, so I tried to get as close to a zero degree bag as possible. To be honest, it wasn't entirely necessary on that trip, but the weather's sort of interchangeable and you, you can't really tell. And sometimes if you're sort of hiking in mountainous areas, it's better just to be safe than sorry anyway. And take the little bit of extra weight by taking a slightly warmer, bigger sleeping bag. This sleeping bag served me pretty well, it was comfortable, it was cheap. Um, I actually prefer synthetic sleeping bags over down sleeping bags because I find down sleeping bags to not cope so well in climates like the UK or more specifically in Scotland where I live. If you're out for longer than sort of three or four days, the moisture content really starts to build up and build up and it starts to get kind of compressed and clammy and it really, it really starts to affect the performance of the sleeping bag. Um, a lot of people say that, yeah, you know, down is great unless you get it wet, synthetics cheaper and heavier, but if you get wet, um, it'll keep you warmer. 
I, I think when people say that they kind of imagine you've fallen into a river or something. Uh, that's not really the case, it's more a case of the accumulation of um, moisture and build up in the atmosphere and your ability to, to dry it off. If you're on the move all the time like we were, you really don't have a lot of time to try and dry off a sleeping bag and if it's raining continuously like it did on the trip I was on, there's no ability to do that and yet every day your sleeping bag is building up a little bit more and more and more moisture. So I find synthetic bags to be more um, more robust to that kind of environment and, and that kind of uh, punishment. The way I travel with it is, I put the sleeping bag inside the bivvy bag uh, for a little bit of added extra protection and then I stuff both of those into a 12 litre dry bag that's a little bit more robust than the one that I used for my clothing. The, the one that I use for the clothing is lightweight, this one is sort of a little bit more medium weight because it takes a little bit more punishment stuffing it in and out of the bag. Firmer rest, I simply just deflate, roll up tightly into uh, a roll and stuff down the side of the inside of my backpack. It doesn't need to be waterproofed up because it's an inflatable mat. I took a small cheap foam sit mat with me. I highly recommend doing that, it gives you a dry place to sit down when you're having your, your lunch. Um, I kind of used it as a little bit of a, an area for preparing my feet on. I used it to um, as a, an additional pillow um, when I was sleeping at night. That's another thing, a pillow by the way, I use my clothing bag as a pillow, I don't take a, an additional pillow with me. Um, for my shelter, I used the DD Super Light um, tarp, the 3B3 version, and I also have paracord um, as a ridge line and on four corners. I take with me sort of uh, about eight pegs, MSR pegs with me. Um, to peg it down in certain places and I also use this, which I'm using as a pointer, um, this pole, um, this basher pole, which is also from MSR, it's a sort of aluminium pole that breaks down into three and I was using this to turn my tarp into um, an enclosed shelter for places where there wasn't trees. If I was going to do this trip again I think I would actually take walking poles with me and if I take walking poles I would leave this at home and use my walking poles for that same function. My cook kit consisted of a titanium Snow Peaks cup, I think it's the 75mm version, with a lid. I took two MSR gas stoves with me. On the five day trip I was using them two or three times a day to boil um, water and I used one and a quarter of these. So one, I completely used one and I used about a quarter of another. So I would say two of them is fairly, um, two of them is enough for that kind of trip. Um, a normal Bic lighter, try and get one with a little LED light on it because it did actually turn out to be kind of handy. A tiny little BRS stove, titanium stove. Um, that was a fantastic stove. I only have good things to say about this stove. Um, it's just great. I may actually consider buying another one of these. Because they're so small and so light, you really could justify taking two of them with you. Just in case you damage it, or break it, or lose it. Doesn't really matter. These things are so cheap and inexpensive and light that you can justify doing that. I took a titanium spork with me. Um, I mean it worked well, I mean it's just a spoon and a fork. To be honest I really don't like these um, because I, I only ever use the spoon side of it and so your hand kind of digs into the fork end and it's also just kind of too short. If you're using those uh, ration packs that you get, those dehydrated meals, you tend to get a little bit on your hand while you're sort of scooping it out. So I think I'm going to update this to a long handle um, titanium spoon at some point. What it's sitting on is my homemade bag cozy, which I made a video about, which is how I prepared my food. Um, I took a headlamp with me. It's the Piso headlamp. It's an incredibly good lamp. It served me well for quite a long time. However, I did manage to crack it on this trip. You can see there I've damaged it a little bit. 
so I'm going to have to um, get that replaced. I didn't take any additional batteries with me for this headlamp because it's sort of late spring, early summer I was going on this trip so it's really only dark for about four hours of the night um, and it's just not necessary. The headlamp is more of an emergency function than anything else. Uh, should I had to hike out of somewhere in the dark I would don the headlamp. I was pretty much going to sleep just as it was getting dark um, and there was no real need for a light. That being said, I also took with me this inflatable light which I kept on the outside of my backpack. Um, you inflate it and it's got like a single LED which the light is dispersed among inside the uh, inflated bag. And inside an enclosed tarp or underneath your tarp is actually incredibly good. Um, it gives you enough light to sort of see what you're doing and get yourself uh, ready and things like that. Um, it's not too bright, it doesn't attract too many bugs. Um, it's pretty good, I think it's worth having. And it's fully waterproof and it's fairly inexpensive, I think I paid about £12 or something for that. Okay, my wash kit is fairly basic. Um, it really just consists of bandanas, I usually have a few of these lying around. Um, my wash kit by the way is also my toiletries kit. Um, so another Bic lighter, um, a small tube of toothpaste, two earplugs with me by the way, see if you're, if you're hiking with other people, snoring really can become a bit of an issue, so earplugs, um, a toothbrush, I'm not one of those people that breaks toothbrushes in half, that one genuinely just snapped. Um, I only took a couple of, uh, like two packs of, what are they, tissue paper, um, and the only thing that's missing from here is the antibacterial gel um, soap thing, which is what I use primarily to wash my hands with and vital body areas. Um, if I was going away for a particularly long trip, where I had to wash my clothing and myself more thoroughly, what I would do is I would take a small bar of hard soap um, and then I would cut slices of the soap off and either dilute it in warm water and wash myself that way or use it to wash my clothing with and things like that. I'm just going to talk a little bit about toiletry stuff here, eh? Because this is something that like really pisses me off on a lot of trails. A lot of people seem to just not understand um, a good way of going to the toilet or, or what to do. Uh, you know, I don't know how many trails I've been on where I find sort of like little mounds of white toilet paper everywhere or you'll go behind you know, objects like if there's a lone boulder in the middle of nowhere you'll go behind it and there's like a huge mound of white toilet paper behind there. It's disgusting, you know, it's just totally unnecessary. All you have to do people is take some tissue paper with you, a cigarette lighter, a means to dig a small hole, and that is it, okay? Go off the trail, off the trail, not on the trail, which for some reason some people insist on doing. Go a little bit off the trail, okay? Dig yourself a shallow hole. It doesn't have to be a huge latrine, just a very shallow hole. Do your business, use the toilet paper, and then burn the toilet paper. Cover it up with soil, and that's it, the end. Okay, how hard is that? Why, why have piles of toilet paper everywhere? And another thing as well, something I noticed when people are talking about using like trowels and stuff like that, okay, and they have these large trout, like gardening trowels that they're taking with them. Okay, that's completely unnecessary. Even the ones that fold down, they're too big and clunky. I mean, what are you doing, digging for treasure? You know, all you need is a stick, your hands, or in my case, what I like to use is something like this. It's just just a tent pig, just a normal tent pig. Keep one tent pig out of your pack and put it in your side pouches. Okay, I use this. Dig myself a little scrape. Do your business in the little scrape. Cover it over. Burn the toilet paper. Sorted. And then we don't have to all see your disgusting white toilet paper everywhere. Ran over. First aid kit and medication. It's something I always see people go absolutely crazy on in these videos for no good reason whatsoever. 
Um, there's a couple items missing from my first aid kit because I was using them at the time, but going through the sort of medication, all you actually really need medication wise, unless you have medication for yourself, that is, is something to control um, basic sort of pain, like you know, sore feet, headache or whatever, so paracetamol and ibuprofen, um, something like modium with you, um, things like diarrhea can be quite common when you're outdoors and you're not used to the kind of food that you're normally eating, so modium can uh, help with that until you can get from one place to the next. Some sort of antihistamine, um, just make sure it's got the proper ingredients in it and it's not one of those fake ones that you can buy. Uh, you, you don't need to buy the expensive kind, just like a supermarket brand antihistamine. I don't actually suffer from hay fever, but even people who don't suffer from it can occasionally be affected by it because you're just sort of being so overwhelmed with, uh, you know, pollen and things like that. I sometimes also take aspirin and a face shield with me. Um, this is obviously optional and of no real use to me. It's really just a case of, in case I come across somebody else on the trail who may need some sort of basic uh, CPR, medical assistance, um, or something like that. I also take a small container like this. This is a dental container and what's in there is a temporary filling cement. Um, I've got like a couple of fillings um, and crowns and if you were to break a filling or a tooth or a crown it's incredibly irritating and really hard to sort that out from your average sort of first aid kit so I take that with me and you know if I lost a crown or something I would put it inside this little container and I would fill in uh, any fillings with temporary cement. Tick removal um, Tweezers, absolutely a must if you're travelling in Scotland and the Highlands at certain times of year, all year round actually, but more specifically at, at certain times of year. Ticks are a massive problem in Scotland. Uh, I had a tick on me every single day on that trip. Every single day, all of us did. Um, they're just everywhere. Compede Glide, uh, which I used on my feet and other areas to try and provide a little bit of uh, anti-chafe. I used that a lot, it came in handy. By the way, my apologies for the stop starting in this video, if it's noticeable, it's because I actually live quite close to a major international airport, and it's bloody annoying, they keep flying over. Um, in addition to this first aid kit, I also had with me quite a lot of Compede plasters, um, which are the, it's a type of gel filled sticking plaster that you put on your, your feet, uh, like an anti-blister type plaster. They're incredibly good. Because my feet were so saturated on that trip, because uh, of the weather, I was getting a lot of blisters because my skin had softened up. And so I was using them all of the time. As well as a few basic ordinary plasters as well for small cuts and wounds and things like that. Just something else to be said about first aid kits is that you really have to adapt a first aid kit based on a, very, a, a, a various amount of factors. Okay, the first one being, uh, what do you actually know how to use? Uh, there are people online who have got paramedic style first aid kits and I'm pretty sure that they haven't got a clue how to use most of the stuff they have in them. It's just bulky, weighty and probably gives you a little bit of false sense of security so I wouldn't bother doing things like that. Also it's dependent on where you're going obviously. You will adapt your first aid kit based on where you're going and the activity you're doing. I take... Um, military grade um, first field dressings for example when I'm going on hunting trips where I have firearms or something of that nature I take a couple of them with me because there's a possibility for something like that having to be used well help um, it's trying to be secured you know if somebody were to get accidentally shot I would do everything I could to try and prevent the bleeding by using them while I was you know contacting the um, rescue to sort of help us get out of that situation. But there's not necessary to take something like that on a trip like the West Highland Way because, well one, hopefully you're not going to get shot on the West Highland Way, and two, any kind of injury that you sustain that is so bad that it would require something like that isn't something that you can really deal with yourself for yourself, you know? Um, 
if somebody says to me, well, I've I seen somebody on YouTube justifying taking splints and stuff with them on the West Highland Way, and uh, they were saying it was in case they sort of fell over and broke a leg or an ankle or something. Well, if you fall over or break a leg or an ankle, I would suggest not wasting your time trying to fit a splint to yourself. I would suggest you just uh, take your mobile phone out and phone 999 and somebody will come and rescue you because that area has full sort of coverage almost of that uh, or somebody will be around that you can sort that out. You're not really going to be messing around trying to fix a broken leg on the West Highland Way. So don't go crazy with the first aid. I use these micro pure water purification tablets. I actually prefer chemical purification um, on trips when it comes to purifying my water. Obviously if you can boil water um, that's better than using any kind of chemical. But on a fast moving trip where you're sort of just gathering water on the go like we were, um, I find these sort of tablets to be the best. They do claim to be um, flavourless. That's not entirely true. They have got a little bit of a chlorine type smell and a slight taste to them. Uh, it's not too bad. It's one tablet per one litre of water. So it's a pretty handy sort of... They're super lightweight um, and they're easy to use. Like I was saying before, I use two one litre bottles of water. As you can see there. And I rotate between them. Now, for the West Highland Way, I would say more than 85-90% of the streams uh, that you'll come across, you don't need to purify at all. You can drink straight from the stream. I was doing it all the time. I live here. I've been doing it my entire life. I've never got sick. Um, of course, it is always possible that, you know, they say that if you go like a mile upstream or whatever, you might find a dead, you know, deer or haggis or sheep or something lying there dead in the water and then you can get sick. Well that may be, but you just use a little bit of common sense, you take a look at the water source that you're taking it from, you know, if it's crystal clear and it's running off the side of a mountain and you don't see any sheep or anything, it's probably okay and you can probably just drink it. Um, if you're a little bit unsure, then just use something like water purification tablets. I don't take a filter with me, because I don't ever find filters to be necessary when I'm in the highlands of uh, Scotland. I would, however, take a filter with me in addition to these on other trips where I didn't really know the quality of the water, for example, or if it was in a, an area that I knew the water was highly sedimented, or there was going to be a lot of animals. Um, you know, if I was like at the Serengeti or something, I would always take a filter with me, plus something like this in addition. Um, and I would go through various layers of sort of purifying my water as much as possible. But for this trip, I took these with me, and I used them five or six times, I think. It's a good idea to take some sort of midge protection. If you're not familiar with what a midge is, it's a tiny, tiny little fly. Um, a tiny, tiny little like mosquito-type fly um, that you get here in Scotland. And they swarm in clouds, and they are unbearable. Absolutely unbearable. They're, they, it's like a tiny little itchy bite that they provide and you can come up in little red marks that are itchy as hell and they're really irritating. An ordinary mosquito net um, for your head or your jacket is not good enough. These things are so small that they can get through the holes of most mosquito nets, in fact all mosquito nets. You need a, a fine midgy net. You see just how fine that is. That is what you need for the dreaded midgy. You can also use other products like uh, DEET or something like Avon Skin So Soft moisturiser to try and prevent them, but I tend to find that to be the best thing for all. Midges have got a season, uh, a hatching season, um, you know, the males and the females and only one of them bites. Uh, and you. They actually have a midge forecast in Scotland, so it's well worth keeping an eye on that to see what kind of numbers are, um, to see if you, you require um, like more DEET or whatever. Uh, so keep an eye on the midge forecast and see if you require. You also get things like horse flies and 
other biting flies uh, in the Scottish Highlands that time of year that can be particularly irritating so it's always a good idea to take some sort of insect protection with you anyway. I also just took a normal beanie hat with me uh, that I was planning on using for cold nights. I never once used this, it wasn't cold. I also took a baseball cap with me that I used um, primarily as a means keeping the sun off me and the rain out of my eyes. Um, gaiters for the footwear that I had on, which I'll get to in a minute. Optional, but they did actually turn out to be pretty useful in some places where there was a lot of sand and dirt and stuff like that. Really all it does is prevent that kind of stuff getting into your shoe and you know you have to stop and take your shoe off to get that little stone out so that's a good thing to have. Something a lot of people overlook is a repair kit for your kit. Okay, um, You can take a, a housewife kit with you, you know basically like a needle and thread and things like that. I didn't take that with me, I, I tend to find that this kit is really all I ever need. Um, what this basically consists of is a means to repair a puncture in my inflating mat, which is a, a type of glue, um, patches, an alcohol wipe that you you know you use to sort of like prepare the area, um, terraid patches, sort of you know, a little sand it down and then you put these patches on. It's basically a, just a little repair kit for a puncture is all that really is. And then a fairly decent amount not too much, but a decent amount of duct tape, or in this case, camo gorilla tape. Um, take, and what you want to do is take, get up one of these plastic type store cards that you can get, and just wrap, you know, a couple of meters worth around the store card, and carry that with you. And that you can use to repair most things. I mean, it, you can repair everything with this stuff. Your backpack. If I ripped a hole in my tarp, I would use this to repair it until I could find a, a more stable means of doing that. Water container, water bottle, as I said before, I took with me two of these, these are one litre each, um, it's just your average sort of store bought plastic bottle with a sports cap. Uh, these are the lightest container you can carry water in and anybody who knows in, that's ever used one of these water bottles will know that they're absolutely indestructible, um, completely disposable once you're done with your trip. And just much easier to use. You know, in an absolute emergency you can actually boil water in these as well, which I wouldn't recommend, but it is possible to do. You don't need to take plastic container flasks or platypuses or anything like that with you on the majority of these trips. Um, Dale, who was on the trip with me, took aluminium containers, which are fine, um, but they're liable to damage and they're heavier and to my mind they're not really that necessary. Um, he liked to use them for hot drinks as well as cold drinks, so um, if that's what you want to use it for, like a type of thermos, that's fine. Gareth, who was on the trip, used a platypus, I think it was a 3 litre. Um, I find that to be unnecessary because really all you ended up doing was filling a platypus full of water after having a drink, and then you're just carrying around 2 or 3 litres of water with you on your back. You know, you're walking past maybe 50 streams before you finish drinking it, and then and then you fill it up again, so you're really just camel and water around for no reason. Um, he also took with him like a massive uh, water filter, which I've done a video on before, um, which is how he purified his water, and also he used it as a, a container for his water. Um, if you're incredibly squeamish about the purification of your water, that's fine. I wouldn't go with that because I think it's too large, bulky and fragile. So, so anyway, this is this is what I use, this is what I would recommend using. A lot of your ultralight through hikers tend to use this method as well. Um, so that's what I would go for. If I was on a bushcraft type trip, I'd take a stainless steel container with me. Because um, weight is less of a priority and I use the stainless steel container basically as a cooking pot as well and things like that. So it's really just a case of adapting what gear you take to the environment and what it is you're going to be doing on that trip. This trip it was a trail, it was continuous walking, so it's about keeping the weight down and 
not taking anything purely for the sake of comfort or some sort of other utility other than the only utility that it's used for, which is to carry and drink water from. Now, when it comes to waterproofs for this trip, now, this particular trip, um, it rained almost continuously, and so I ended up wet anyway. None of my kit got wet by putting it in the appropriate dry bags and keeping it inside the pack. So the waterproofing of the kit worked absolutely fine. The waterproofing of myself, like I said before, was a tend to go with the principle that as long as the environmental temperature allows it, simply getting wet is just a consequence of being out in the rain. Just, just get wet. Uh, just make sure you always have a set of dry clothes. That being said, what I took with me um, was this poncho, uh, which I'm using here as a mat. Uh, it's just, it's a cheap, lightweight, square poncho, you know, with the hood in the middle, the, the average type one. And I would frequently use it as when there was like large downpours of rain, I would put this on over the top of me and over the top of my bag. And that kept the, va the vast majority of the water um, from reaching me and reaching my pack. Um, there are a few cons to this which I discovered really which is it's not really the kind of thing that's uh, that, that works particularly well if it's windy so we were walking along the side of Corrock Hill and you know it wasn't really providing me with much protection at all. Uh, it was blowing around even if you tie it on it still blows around a little bit. It also kind of became saturated after a while I would put it on in downpours but the inside of it was still kind of damp. That being said, it's incredibly breathable in the sense that because it's open at the sides, you know, you you can't get any better breathability. So the airflow was continuous, and it, it was quite a, nice to be able to sort of just really easily put this on or take it off, depending on the the weather. And um, because wearing a waterproof jacket all the time, if you're walking, you get incredibly hot and you, you end up just sweating inside it. When they say jackets like Gore-Tex and stuff are breathable, it's not that they're lying, they're just not entirely telling you the truth. There's no way in the world that a jacket or material can be breathable enough to allow your moisture to get out of it um, at the rate that you produce it. Also, all these waterproof type jackets that you get, if it's raining, they, they have a wetting out point. You know, they, they become so wet that they're wetted out. And, and that's just it. I mean, unless you're wearing some rubber fisherman's thing, it's going to wet out at some point. And when they get wet, they lose most of their ability to um, let the moisture that's coming off your body from your walking and your sweating escape through the material. So that should be bared in mind as well. I think if I was going to do this trip again, I would avoid taking this with me and I would try and invest in something like a decent Paramo waterproof jacket. They're quite expensive but they're the most breathable you can get and they're fairly comfortable. Uh, that being said, the two my two colleagues that were on the uh, trip with me, um, one of them was wearing the Bear Grylls waterproof jacket which was pretty cheap, which cost about £50 and the other, uh, Gareth, was wearing, um, I can't remember what it was but it was he said in one of the videos, I think it was video number one, he says the name of it and it was incredibly expensive, it was nearly £200 I think and it wetted out in no time at all, so it didn't keep them dry at all. The cheaper £50 Bear Grylls jacket did keep uh, Dale dry. Because I was sleeping under a tarp as well and I wasn't using an enclosed tent, this became my ground sheet and it was incredibly good as a ground sheet. Um, you need a ground sheet if you're going to go on multi-day trips like this because if it's raining the ground can become saturated and muddy and there's ticks and there's other things that you want to just have an area that you can sort of put your kit down on and be secure in the knowledge that you know, you're not going to damage it or get it wet and stuff like that. If I was going to change something about uh, the gear for this kind of trip is Something I think I would consider now doing is taking a lightweight hammock with me uh, that would get me up off the ground because the ticks at that time of the year just they were just un unbearable almost uh, they were just everywhere and the terrain um, the wet terrain and the wet ground did become a little bit of an issue after a while 
So a lightweight hammock in addition to my tarp would probably be uh, what I would uh, take with me next time. And I would probably then uh, not take this with me. I would, uh, you know, I would just take that. I would still take the sleeping bag, the bivvy bag however, where I was using an enclosed tarp to sleep in. Um, so a hammock wouldn't be any use there, so you'd be sleeping on the ground anyway. And in that case, you would need something to protect your sleeping bag and yourself from the ground and just your mat wouldn't suffice. You, you would need to have a bivvy bag with you. So I would still take the bivvy bag with me. Basically the clothing that I had on my person is a duplicate of what you've seen in my spare clothing. I had the Bear Grylls uh, Survivor trousers on, Merino wool socks, good um, running type, uh, tight fitting, breathable underwear. I was wearing a breathable shirt and I would occasionally inter inter uh, uh, switch. Uh, I would occasionally put on the micro fleece whenever I was cold. As for footwear, I wore these Footwear is one of the most important things to consider, obviously, if you're going on a trip that involves a lot of walking or hiking. And traditionally, um, people will wear sort of big hiking type boots, big heavy type hiking boots. Um, but if you are using gear like this, where you've kept the weight down significantly, you really just do not need those big heavy boots um, weighing, weighing you down. I have heard it said that an experiment was done years ago by the US military that suggested that every pound of weight on your feet was the equivalent of having seven pounds of weight on your back in terms of energy uses. Now I don't entirely know how true that is but I've heard it said a few times now. So something lightweight like a speed cross trainer like this shoe um, is fairly ideal. Um, you can get waterproof or non-waterproof versions. Um, in my view a waterproof version is not entirely necessary because to be honest you're really not going to keep your feet dry. Um, you, you cross a stream if it's raining for a long time eventually those waterproof uh, shoes which are usually just Gore-Tex lined versions of these um, will get wet and when they're wet they're harder to dry out because they've got that extra additional uh, layer in them. Um, so these are the non-waterproof version of these. You can see speed cross shoes have got like large grips uh, kind of like a jungle boot that gives you better sort of traction on the muddy type trails that you're likely to encounter on, on these trips and these particular kind have got uh, the speed cr uh, lacing system which uh, you know I suspect is why they're called that. It's a thing about consider how you would repair a lace by the way something a lot of people forget is if you're taking shoes with you um, think about what would happen if you broke your lace, how would you fix that? And I would fix this if I couldn't tie it up with the paracord, the line, the, the line that you get inside the paracord is how I would repair this. Additionally if you've got a shoe that has a lace, just take an extra lace with you. It's something people don't think about and but when you break one it's a real pain in the arse to try and sort out.